So I'm just standing here on Columbia Street and Kiefer, which is one block west of Maine, is Columbia. And just over a hundred years ago, Columbia Street was the, the shore of Falls Creek. So all this would be waterfront property, and it went all the way up to Pender Street, all the way to where Bob Rennie's art gallery is. You can find and, stuff to do in the, the Chinese cultural, cultural, cultural center over by Carroll Street. So this is a great big bay. Of course, it was tidal flat, um, so it was filled in pretty early on. This this part here between Columbia and Carroll. The big bay here it just became a train yard. The Great Northern Way train had all the train tracks here. So this area here, this block between Columbia and Maine, it was very industrialized. There's big piles of wood, big piles of coal here, because you could barge it in and barge it out, uh, waterfront property. So it's sort of bulk industrial materials. And uh, so there's a lot of smoke and dirt and, you know, yeah. As a matter of fact, just a block down, um, right in here, where the parkade is, was the Vancouver Gas Company. And they had three enormous cylinders that they stored gas in. This is in the days before natural gas. Natural gas didn't really arrive until the late 50s. But they used to be able to produce it by, I think, by um, heating up coal. Coal gas, it was called. I suppose you could even get it from wood. Anyhow, they stored great big really huge containers and uh, that operation was just right here. On the other side of that is where Georgia Street came down. The original Georgia Vida came down Georgia Street which is a block or two north of where the current viaduct is on Pryor. So just right there Georgia Street dead ended and uh, back then it was called Harris Street just to confuse things. And about 1910 that became a prime location for houses of prostitution because it was this little short street just off of Maine coming down to the waterfront that was surrounded by industrial um, operations. And so they built about seven uh, houses of prostitution in there. And, um, and of course, it was on this little short bit of Harris Street coming down to the waterfront. The people that were building new houses on Harris Street in Strathcona, of course, were horrified when people asked them where they lived and they said Harris Street and people would say, oh, you mean, you know, you're living by the houses of prostitution? So they actually changed the name of that one block long strip of Harris Street, they changed it to Shore Street. So Shore Street was code for prostitution back 100 years ago. So it's interesting just to look around here. Um, I'm actually pretty familiar with this area. Probably some of my first childhood memories are from coming down here because my dad worked just a block over for BC Electric there at Carroll and Hastings and he used to take us down here for dinner, like let's say 1953, 54. My, probably the first restaurant I ever went to was the Ho Ho Chop Suey there uh, down by, um, I guess that's it right there, right in Columbia and um, Pender. Anyhow, so. My dad did talk about this area, like the original Georgia viaducts. You can see the current one, which they're talking about tearing down. My father was very, spent his whole career down here, and he used to talk about how, and, and he did come to Vancouver in 1911. So he used to talk about how when they built the, the first viaducts in about 1914, 1915, it, it literally went down Georgia Street, downtown, and then continued down Georgia Street here, which is the street right there, not Prior Street where it is now. Anyhow, he said that they were quite uh, well known when he was a kid, because when the, the soldiers were marching in the First World War to go to war um, from the Beatty Street Armory, they were marching across the Georgia Viaduct. They were told they had to break step and not march in unison, because big chunks of the viaduct were falling off underneath. And the reason why that was, my dad was a civil engineer and so, so was I. Um, the reason why they had to break step was, the contractor who got the low bid to build the viaducts, he bid too low. And so the only way he could attempt to make money was not to put hardly any cement in the cement, in, in the concrete. You know, concrete is cement and gravel and sand. Well, he cut back on the amount of cement 
because it was more expensive than sand. So he just pumped up the sand and lowered the cement content. So there's almost nothing holding that bridge together except the rebar. So big chunks of it were just dropping off of it right from when it was built in 1915. So by 1915, it was a, a well-known hazard. And of course, that's part of the reason why they tore it down and replaced it with the, with the viaducts we have right now. The Sun Yat-sen Garden here uh, is built over the ocean. It, well, this was ocean up until about 100 years ago. And um, 100 years ago, this bay here was filled in to create a train yard, a whole series of train tracks, about half a dozen train tracks, and, and the train station for the Great Northern Railway. Um, the whole of Falls Creek was very industrial. Trains, big piles of coal, big piles of wood, all kinds of sawmills, big heavy industrial plants for making equipment for sawmills, in other words, steel fabricating places, and such as the Canron building, which was torn down just only 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, so when I was a kid in the 50s, you know, it was Falls Creek here was full of sawmills, maybe 10 sawmills. And the whole of Falls Creek was full of logs that were being fed into the sawmills. And people in Vancouver in the 50s, you heated your house with a mountain of sawdust in your basement. And it was the sawdust from all these sawmills going 24 hours a day. Um, and that, the smell of sawdust is a very familiar smell to people who, who were around in those days. Uh, that all ended, well, you know, in the 50s, there were, you could get coal oil, heat, you know, heat your house with oil, but, or you could get a pile of coal. Like, we had a coal bin, like a, where we lived on West 20th, we had a coal bin, and we lived in Abbotsford for a couple of years, and we had a basement full of sawdust when we lived in Abbotsford. So I, I'm, I'm familiar with uh, not having natural gas. It's interesting, so natural gas didn't arrive until they built a pipeline from Alberta because there's not really any other way to get natural gas here in bulk. And it just so happens that my father, who worked down here for BC Electric, his job in 1958 when we moved to Abbotsford was to put in the pipes, the whole system of natural gas to the whole Fraser Valley. So he spent you know, a decade of his life laying that system in and it's the reason why you have natural gas in your house today is because my dad was a big part of that as an engineer. But, um, but it's amazing how much things have changed just to compare Vancouver today, this spot here, to let's say 1950. In 1950, there would have been 110 days of fog here, right here. The fog horns would be going for months on end, nonstop. Uh, uh, I grew up with that sound. It's all gone now. We only get about 10 days of fog a year. You're lucky if you even hear a foghorn. And that's just changed because they got rid of the sawmills. So there's been a lot of change. And now, of course, it's almost all residential down here. But if, even in the 50s, if you had a job in Vancouver, you know, you, you probably took a streetcar to downtown, uh, starting in, 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 you know, well, 1900, 1910. If you lived in Vancouver, a young guy, you, you would have taken the streetcar down to Falls Creek, worked in a sawmill, worked in a factory, worked in a steel fabricating plant, in smoke and noise, fire, you know, hammering, clanging, banging. You know, that would be a normal job. It's just interesting to compare that to a young person today. If you look at Vancouver a hundred years ago, we're, we're standing here right on Columbia Street, which is one block west of Main. And you can see here in the map, this is Main Street coming down across Falls Creek. So we're just standing here on the edge of the ocean. And um, so Falls Creek was this great, quite a large body of water that got all completely filled in up to Main Street just a few years after this. And you can see, by the way, that this is back when Vancouver is just a series of streetcar villages. So Grandview, Cedar Cottage, Mount Pleasant, you know, Main Street, are all separate streetcar villages. And as I was saying, even up until the 1950s, the Falls Creek was, was uh, full of sawmills, this purple. This is 1900, 10 years earlier. 
And I just show this map because it shows you that at low tide, most of Falls Creek was dry. So it wasn't so much, Falls Creek wasn't so much a port as sort of a, a place you could barge in materials and unload them in shallow water. Even if, and if the tide went out, your barge would just sit on the ground, it didn't matter. And the same thing with the log booms. They'd tow in huge rafts of logs and, and park them around this sandy part. And it didn't matter when the tide went out, they'd just sit on the ground. And then they'd feed them into the sawmills uh, in the daytime, or in, when the tide came in. So it was a bit different than the, than the, this is one of the finest harbors in the whole world, protected with a narrow entrance and so forth. So Falls Creek was good for sawmills, uh, and that's what, what ended up there, right up to the 1950s. So and then the next decade, this is you can see Falls Creek gets filled in with the train yards because it's dead flat land. It was easy to fill it in. They, they cut the Grandview cut and used that 100 feet of dirt to fill in Falls Creek. And it was perfect for train yards, nice and flat. But you can see the whole of Falls Creek is industrial land. And now they're all pretty well all gone, ex except for a little bit of Granville Island. There's a bit of industry left there. It's all gone over to residential.